Hello, everyone. My name is Ashutosh, and I am part of the open source software group within ARM. And today I'm going to talk about some basic concepts about device security for uh, connected devices. I'll start with some uh, common use cases which are applicable to all of the connected devices and the security challenges they face. Uh, some of the uh, basic principles, security principles, which can be applied to all the use cases. And then I'll briefly talk about the PSA uh, program, the Platform Security Architecture from Program from ARM, and a brief introduction to the Trusted Firmware M project at the end. And in the end, we'll have some time for questions and answers. In connected devices space, every device is unique and every use case is unique. However, there are some common uses patterns. If you look deep enough, there is a underlying theme across all the different use cases. All the devices, they need some form of uh, connectivity. It could be device to device communication or it could be communication between a device and a server or it could be a communication between device to a um, node in, the, in, a, in a mesh network. There is some form of data processing involved in all the use cases. The data could be sensor data being collected on a device and securely transmitted to a remote entity. It could be DRM data, um, if you talk about the multimedia content. It could be biometric data in case of uh, medical devices. And the usage patterns of this data is very complex, and the ownership of this data becomes extremely complex to manage. Device management. The devices that get deployed are meant to be in the field for uh, many years, and the scale of depo deployment is quite large, and it's going to be even uh, larger in the future. They cannot be managed individually, and they cannot be managed uh, on a on, man-to-man um, -man basis they need to be managed remotely somehow and in a, in a more automated fashion. Vendors might want to control certain features based on the licensing model uh, for a particular use case. Uh, vendors might want to um, revoke or invoke certificates on a device based on the subscription that the user has uh, uh, paid for. Um, there will be firmware updates because, again, devices are going to be in the field for a very long time. There will be security fixes and the feature updates and the bug fixes on the device. And finally, the incident management. There will be uh, security incidents. There will be cases where uh, devices uh, become vulnerable. The software uh, become um, uh, broken down by uh, security researchers or uh, hackers, and they need to be fixed by firmware update. And finally, the vendor management. The ecosystem is going to be very complex where uh, different silicon vendors, different operating system vendors, and the OEMs, they try to collaborate with each other and they would want to limit the trust they need to put in each other. So it's a very complex um, um, supply chain where we want to make sure that the amount of trust each vendor need to put in each other has, has, is um, contained and is limited. And all of these user scenarios have some underlying common security challenges. All of the communicating entities, before they start any communication, they would want to establish a trust. They would want to make sure that they are talking to the right entity on the other end. If a server is talking to a device, there are certain tr implied trust. And that trust could mean that the, if, if your end device is compromised, it can compromise the rest of the network. And once the trust is established, the communication itself needs to be secured because the physical medium on which they actually communicate can be a um, compromisable network. It could be a, a network which itself is not secure. When I talk about the data management, this is probably the most complex bit, and it has a lot of uh, socioeconomic issue, uh, aspects as well. Who owns the data if, it, if you're talking about the biometric device, uh, if you're talking about the DRM license management, that's even more complex, where you would want to um, leave the content on a device for a limited period of time, and the subscription ex expires, you would want to be able to show that the content cannot be used or reused or reused or misused 
beyond the given time. Similarly, for device provisioning, since there, there are monetary aspects attached to the uh, device provisioning, uh, feature enablement and disablements, uh, we would want to make it secure so that the subscription model and the um, uh, money-making models pe people make are supported by the uh, underlying security basics. And finally, the vendor management and the firmware updates. I think it is quite evident that the managing different vendors and their mutual trust is a very complex scenario. And um, the, when, we, when we talk about the firmware updates, they're even more complex because the software could be coming from many different places. The secure side software vendor could be another entity. The, the non-secure side and the business case vendor could be another entity. And you may want to install applications coming from multiple other partners and they wouldn't want to trust each other. To address all these uh, different uh, security uh, scenarios and different use cases, there are some underlying um, basic principles. There are underlying building blocks which can be applied to all of the use cases. And while this is not an exhaustive list, this covers, this provides the initial building blocks that you need to have to, to secure a uh, end device in a connected mesh. Immutable root of trust. This is the absolutely trusted part of your device. And when, you, when, when someone creates a threat model for their use case, this need to be ensured that uh, uh, the initial part of the system need to be ensured to be non-mutable. And if the initial part is compromised, all bets are off. So for any use case, you need to have the absolute start point for your trust in the device itself. That leads to the chain of trust and software integrity. The uh, different links in the chain need to validate the next link in the, in, the, in, the, in the chain and make sure that the next entity is certified and is validated and is not compromised. And by creating this chain, we ensure that the, all, of the, all of the software that is running on a device is not compromised. Hardware and software will have bugs. They will have issues. And since the devices are going to be in the field for a very long time, we would want to contain the scope of every vulnerability that gets, ex gets exposed, be it the hardware or the uh, software. So the principle of least privilege means that your system should be divided in the smallest possible pieces, which do not lead to, to trust each other. So um, your applications could be, should, be, should be given just enough privilege so that they can function and nothing else. And the same principle applies to the rest of the system as well. The software should be updatable. So if a device is de deployed, we will want to make sure that uh, any vulnerability that it get ex gets exposed in the future in the hardware or the software can be mitigated by providing a software update. Device identification and authentication. This is interesting because the, uh, when you talk about the secure communication, it is not only, uh, uh, it's not sufficient to establish a secure link between two devices or two entities. It's also important to make sure that they recognize each other, for which you need to have a very unique identifier which ties a device, the secure communication to a, to a unique device. So the, the server or the uh, rece receiving side on, the, um, on your uh, IoT device, they can authenticate each other and they can trust each other. Finally, lifecycle management. Uh, when you talk about a device uh, manufacturing process, there are multiple vendors involved. The silicon could be given by one partner while the OEM could be putting the whole system around the silicon, while the software could be coming from so many different places. To be able to secure the supply chain and the different stages of the uh, supply chain, it's important, important to compartmentalize that aspect as well. It's important to limit the resources, hardware and software resources, which are visible in the different parts of your, the uh, product lifecycle development. Let's look at uh, these different building blocks in a bit more detail, uh, one by one. Root of trust and the chain of trust. 
root of trust and chain of trust usually go together. They, they need, they, they kind of, um, uh, they, they, they go together. Most of the time, the root of trust need to be implemented in the RTL itself. So to be able to compromise the device, you need to be able to compromise the RTL, um, and which is normally quite difficult and in, involves uh, hardware level and very deeply embedded um, attack. Uh, the immutable, immutable root of trust is responsible for initiating the root of trust. So it is responsible for um, authenticating the next, next set of the software which is going to run on a device, and it should be able to do it securely. And that security is, uh, or rather that guarantee is provided by the cryptography. So the next stage of the software should be signed by the public key of the uh, software vendor, and the device should be able to authenticate the uh, software which is running on the device by checking the, the signature of the binary. Uh, this, the, the immutable root of trust is also the very first entry point in the system. So it also need to assist in the factory floor, floor provisioning. When the device is, is, is coming out of the fabrication, uh, you need to provision keys, you need to provision the software, you need to provision the um, uh, hardware keys coming from different vendors, and that part also might require um, some level of guarantee so that the, the whole process of provisioning itself is not compromised on the factory floor. And the initial uh, root of trust may be required to assist in the initial factory provisioning. Then the next stage, which is, again, the next stage is, is a logical step. When you talk about the updatable bootloader, this is a logical separation. In some of the use cases, the next stage could be clubbed in the, the immutable root of trust, or it could be clubbed with the runtime software. So this block is essentially, in, in some of the very simple use cases, can be clubbed with the uh, immutable root of trust. Because for simple use cases, you may not want to spend the additional RAM, ROM, and the hardware requirements that come with the um, actual physical separation of the different stages of the boot. So when you talk about the updatable uh, boot order, you should be able to authenticate the, the final, uh, the business case software, which is going to run on the device. It also needs to participate in the firmware update process. Um, I'll try to cover the firmware update, or a example firmware update process in one of the later slides. It will become slightly clearer why bootloader gets involved in this stage. Finally, the runtime software. The runtime software is where you implement your business use case, your actual uh, final uh, use case, which is um, very device specific. It also need to support uh, the firmware update process and provide the final use case level compartmentalization of the system. The next building block, principle of least privilege. This is not limited, the compartmentalization is not limited to just hardware or the software. This is a general principle that one should follow throughout the um, product development life cycle and see if there are two aspects of the system which can be compartmentalized so that they do not um, compromise e each other or cannot uh, interfere with uh, each other. Hardware software compartmentalization is a key aspect of it because that's where most of the complexities of the system are going to lie. The compartment, uh, compartmentalization also applies to cryptographic keys, especially the hardware keys where if the same uh, key is used for deriving multiple different uh, hard, um, cryptographic keys for different use cases, one would want to make sure that the key derivation tree is very clean and the key hierarchy is set up in a way that no one can um, make their way back into deriving a key for a different use case. Um, if you look at this block diagram, in this, this is the conventional system that most of us are um, uh, familiar with, where you would have some sort of OS kernel scheduler um, uh, privileged code handler, which will run on the, on the, at the hardware level. 
It will have provide certain um, OS features. And on top of it all, you would have the application firmware, and there's the conventional system that we are, we are used to seeing. Now, in the conventional systems, it's possible that you have a lot of security aware software as well, either in this part or in the, in the OS part. And the more complex the, the application software becomes, the more complica complicated the uh, OS kernel becomes, it becomes harder to contain the security vulnerabilities. So what this means, we should separate the security aware aspects of the system and put it on a different sandbox, which is what this sandbox provides. That you separate the system in a uh, business case, uh, business use case is specific software, and all of the security aware um, uh, software can be implemented and handled on the right hand side of this picture. And this boundary should be uh, enforced by the hardware itself. Now, once the separation is done, there are different scenarios where the secure side software itself could be coming from different vendors. Um, there could be certain uh, very use cases specific, for example, DRM. DRM, if you're talking about the DRM use case, that, and if you're talking about multiple uh, vendors for DRM use cases, they would have some level of functionality on the secure world, some level of functionality here. And if there are different vendors again, they would not want to trust each other. They would want to have some level of guarantee that a uh, vendor um, content provider A is not able to see the certificates and keys of the content provider B. For that reason, there's a need to have uh, compartmentalization on the secure side as well, which is what this block, uh, these green boxes represent. That you need to have the uh, boundary between the non-secure side software and the secure side software, but secure side software itself need to have a compartmentalization to be um, able to ensure that different um, vendors can implement their software without worrying about someone stealing their data or their uh, software IP. Firmware update, um, I already mentioned that um, hardware and software will have vulnerabilities. The devices are going to be deployed for a very long time and someone will break them. And we need to be able to react to that in some cases and in some cases proactively identify issues and go and fix them. And once the issues are identified and fixed, we need to have a secure mechanism to provide those updates to millions of millions or billions of devices which are in the field. So the devices should have a automated way of being updated. And when you talk about the firmware update, this again becomes very complex when you talk about the multi vendor scenarios. The secure side software could be coming from one place, the non-secure side software could be coming from a different place, and the device should be able to securely uh, get the, up, um, get the um, firmwares from different uh, vendors, be able to compartmentalize them, be able to assemble them together without compromising the uh, originally intended um, separation of logic between uh, different entities. So this is a sample, this is an example implementation of how um, the uh, secure firmware update can be performed on a device. You have the separation between the secure world and non-secure world. The update client on the non-secure side would download the binary from the server or another connected device. It will talk to its peer in the secure world and ask to, it to authenticate the downloaded binary. And once the authentication is, has passed, the binary will be dumped into the flash. And after which device would be reset, the bootloader comes up and it sees that there's a new binary in the system and it'll, it need to perform some checks, some cryptographic checks to make sure that the image is not a, a tampered image or there's no, it's not a rollback um, attack, it's not some old binary which is being provided again on the device. And all those actions can be performed by the bootloader to secure the whole process. Device identification and authentication. I already talked about the immutable unique identity. It is important to have a device identity which cannot be uh, spoofed, which cannot be uh, tampered with, 
to ensure that the communicating entities are able to absolutely trust each other. And the uh, communication, again, need to be uh, secured between the uh, communicating entities. But before the communication could start, the, uh, the trust establishment can be run through cryptographic um, certificates. Having said that, it's not as simple as that. In very simple devices, you wouldn't want to put a very complex certificate parsing software. For example, if you're talking about light bulb, I wouldn't want to implement a lot of software logic or hardware logic to be able to perform um, RSA signature check or ECDSA uh, signature check. In those cases, we need to find a different approach. And in some cases, it's okay to have a shared secret between your light bulb and the router that you, have, you may have installed on your, on your, um, uh, in your home. And if they have a pre-programmed provision uh, symmetric, symmetric key, they could use that symmetric key for um, establishing the trust with each other. Finally, the device attestation. Attestation is a uh, concept which is quite heavily uh, being standardized uh, in the industry right now. What this means is this is a health report or it's a report card of the device that gets sent to the, to the uh, remote entity, a remote entity being a cloud entity. The report contains the information such as what is the boot signature, what was the um, um, hash of the de um, hash of the image, which is running on the device, what's its physical location, what's its identity, and based on the report that gets sent by the device to the server, the server can decide whether it should, it should trust the device or should it allow it certain uh, features, or should it um, completely block this because the software version that it has has vulnerabilities. For the lifecycle management, instead of trying to focus on the solution, I am trying to highlight some of the problems because it's a very complex topic and I would not be able to talk about this in given time. The, when you talk about the lifecycle management, the first stage is silicon manufacturer. Silicon manufacturer need to be able to secure the device provisioning, need to make sure that on the factory floor, when these, uh, the uh, keys are being pro programmed or the identities of the device are being programmed, the whole process is secure and it's guaranteed to work in a certain way. And the manual, the, the human interaction in the whole process doesn't affect the uh, guarantee that the system is going to provide in the later phase of the life cycle. Also, the silicon vendor might want to follow a certain licensing model. What that means is they, would, they might want to create a single device with multiple peripherals or multiple uh, features, but based on the subscription model the OEM has um, paid for, they may want to limit the features and the, um, they might, may want to limit the features and may want absolute guarantee that those features cannot be um, hacked or they cannot be maliciously enabled or disabled. Similarly, when it comes to um, OS vendor or the OEM, the o there, there, there is a need to have a central entity which will integrate all the software coming from different places, make sure that they all work together. At the same time, ensuring that the, the different vendors do not end up compromising each other's um, uh, software or IP, uh, the hardware IP. Finally, when the device is deployed, uh, the complex complexity there is how do you manage different fragments coming from different devices? How do you, um, and if uh, a device is compromised beyond the um, repairable state, then how do you make sure that the device is not usable anymore? This is a very small snippet of the uh, life, man, life cycle management problem, and that's where I would leave the life cycle management. To support these uh, different building uh, blocks for security, there is a need to have um, hardware building blocks which can support these uh, different security functionalities. And uh, so this is not, again, exhaustive list, but just a quick look at the bare, bare essentials that most of the devices would need to have. Immutable root of trust, we already talked about that. This is going to be mostly the RTL code, the ROM code that uh, people put in devices. 
Having said that, if for a certain use case, the, um, the physical guarantees are made about the uh, silicon itself and the, there, are, there, are, there are certain threat vectors the uh, final use case owner doesn't want to worry about or doesn't care about, then the immutable, immutable root of trust can be a programmable entity. You could have OTPs in the systems uh, that can be programmed as the provisioning time and that becomes the uh, programmed uh, immutable root of trust. The hardware unique key, this allows binding uh, the file system on a device to a specific device and whatever you store on a device. So make, by making sure the hardware, uh, by, by making sure that there is a unique key uh, programmed on the hardware, you ensure that all the file systems that are there on the device are tied to that device. So if someone tries to pluck out the file system and the storage system from the, from the device and tries to play it back on a different device, it would fail because the file system would have been encrypted by the hardware unique key, which is going to be different for different samples of the same device. Uh, device identity, we talked about that as well. This is uh, important to have in a system to make sure that uh, the uh, communicating entities can identify each other. Non-volatile counters, they, they are required to make sure that when a device is um, exposed to rollback attacks, then using these counters, you can verify if the new image or the uh, file system content, so new image coming from the server or new Im image coming from the um, uh, external storage or the contents of the file system are not content from a previous iteration which may have um, expired certificates in case of the file system or in case of binary might have uh, vulnerabilities. So non-volatile counters are required on the system to ensure that these rollback attacks cannot be performed. Then comes the hardware isolation support. We talked about the software and hardware compartmentalization but to be able to support that on a system, you need to have support on a device itself, on the hardware itself, to facilitate the compartmentalization. Root of trust keys uh, on a device would ensure that uh, different players on the, in, the, in a multi-vendor scenarios can control their assets separately. For example, a silicon vendor can use the root of trust, uh, their, their root of trust keys to enable, disable their features. The OEM can have their own um, uh, root of trust to enable disable their own um, uh, content management policy. Crypto accelerator, while this is not a mandatory requirement on a system, you could perform cryptography in um, software, but a lot of times it's better to have the cryptography in the hardware and uh, not allow the software to see the hardware keys and instead allow the cryptographic accelerator to make use of these hardware keys. So that way, if there is a, a compromise in the, in the software, the compromise doesn't affect the originally uh, provisioned hardware keys. It would uh, then, then, and after which you can create a different key derivation tree and discard the old software and old, old keys and rely on the new key derivation policy. And finally, the lifecycle management. Uh, there are aspects of lifecycle management which need to be handled in the hardware and need to be enforced by the hardware, hardware and it should be built in in the um, silicon itself. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so is the question that how, um, how many secure partitions can be supported in a system? This is very use case specific. I'll come to some of the software uh, building blocks that we provide in one of the later slides, but this again depends on the use case. If you're talking about a very simple uh, use case, again, light bulb, you probably need two um, uh, building blocks on the secure side, cryptography and secure storage and that's probably good enough for a very simple use case. In some of the more complex use cases, 
the, uh, for example, DRM. DRM will require certain software to be running on the secure side as, as well. So what that means, your, all of your, uh, in DRM, if you are using uh, GPUs and display process to do the um, uh, decoding, then you would need some software which can handle the um, interfaces for the graphics uh, hardware or the video driver and some software which can do the final overlay between these different, um, uh, differently generated layers. And that software can become quite complex. And that software it itself might be compartmentalized into different parts on the secure side. So it's very hard to say how many blocks, is, how many blocks do you need um, in, in general. It's very use case specific. There is no hardware imposed. Well, you have limited memory. So you may have limited memory and limited uh, hardware resources. Yeah, so the framework wise, there is no limit how much you can, you can put on the, um, of course, if you, you can talk about the extremes where your uh, unit 32 calculations might overflow if you're talking about more than four um, giga partitions, but those are the extremes. Platform security architecture. Uh, ARM, this is an initiative from ARM, which it got launched sometime in uh, 2017, and just last week it became public. All of the specifications and uh, uh, documentations and the philosophy behind that is now uh, publicly available. This again, uh, the platform security architecture is a overarching program which covers not only what I just talked about, but it has much bigger scope um, in general. Um, uh, as, as you see it here, it, it has three major aspects, analyzing what the different use cases are, understanding what kind of threats uh, they, they um, get exposed to, and based on the understanding that built by the, the initial analysis, architecting the specifications, architecting the uh, different parts of the hardware and soft software to ensure that the, the threat vectors which have been identified can be mitigated. And finally, the software implementation, which is what the Trusted Firmware M project is. The Trusted Firmware M provides uh, open source uh, implementation of PSA uh, architecture. This is a very high level view of what the Trusted Firmware M project is. It's open source project, it's governed by a governance body. I think we announced the governance uh, as well uh, sometime last week in TechCon. Um, what we have today is some of these building blocks in the system. The TFM program, uh, TFM software provides a boot order which, talks, which takes care of the initial root of trust and the uh, chain of trust. It provides this uh, isolation between the non-secure world and the security aware part of the system. Then there is a framework which allows this separation between the different worlds and the, on the secure world, um, a different, different box, different um, parts of the security aware software. So in the absolute terms, Bootloader is going to have, um, will have the highest amount of privilege and highest amount of um, access to the system resources. In some cases, bootloader will block uh, certain resources and only allow um, uses of certain resources in the rest of the, uh, rest of the software, um, one of them being the hardware unique key. At the bootloader front, at the bootloader stage itself, uh, we could derive a key from the hardware unique key and block the access to the hardware keys, saying that beyond this, no one can make direct use of the um, um, hardware keys and instead has to use the derived keys that are given by the bootloader. In which case, uh, all the compromised paths to hardware keys gets blocked out. Then comes the framework and the SPM. This is the part which uh, provides sandboxing for the runtime software. And now the initial boot process and the initial rule of trust 
is, is verified and is uh, finished. SPM here, the secure partition manager here, provides the sandboxing between different, uh, different parts here. Finally, there are some common building blocks which apply across different use cases. Across, I would say some of this is, will apply to all of the use cases. Things like crypto and secure storage, uh, in some cases at the station as well, they apply no matter what uh, the use case is, you need to have uh, secure communication, you need to have a um, way of uh, securely transmitting data between two entities for which you need to have crypto cryptographic support to be able to do uh, secure TLS. Um, some of these entities, audit log, this provides um, trace of what happened on a device in case there, had, there is a security incident. It provides mitigation against the repudiation attacks where um, if a certain transaction was requested by entity, that entity cannot deny later on saying that I never, I never made that request in the first place, for example, financial transactions. So it, it creates a log on the device of the security critical events on the system so that that can be used to um, verify the claims later on on behalf of the device vendor. And finally, we know that every use case is going to have different uh, software, they need uh, different building blocks, and there will be use, use cases specific software and which will need a different sandbox altogether. So the Trusted Firmware M project provides a uh, way to create these user specific sandboxes as well. I'll walk you through a very simple example to showcase how it all fits together in terms of software. This is a use case where a secure TLS connection is established between a remote entity and the device. On this side, on this side, this is the conventional software. You might have the TLS stack here. In whenever a TLS transaction is uh, initiated, there will be some cryptographic um, operations to be done. Now, for the TLS use case, it needs cryptography, but the protocol itself doesn't need to see the exact um, cryptographic key being used for the um, uh, encryption, decryption, authentication. So by uh, following the logic of um, least privilege, we compartmentalize the system into multiple smaller parts, small part, uh, one small part being the secure storage, which actually has the content, which actually has the um, TLS keys and certificates. The crypto is a cryptographic engine which can perform requests on behalf of all the uh, callers uh, on the non-secure side or the callers could be somewhere here in the secure side as well. So for the TLS use case, TLS makes a request for uh, encryption, decryption slash authentication. The com uh, request comes to the crypto. Crypto checks, uh, crypto fetches the key from the um, uh, secure storage in, in plain text and then it performs a check to see if this calling entity, this on, based on this framework, based on this framework, it, it'll check if the calling entity is allowed to make use of this key or not. Or it, does this key belong to another entity somewhere here? If that check passes, then it'll make use of that key in this domain itself, perform the uh, cryptography, again, encryption, decryption, uh, authentication and return the result back to the caller in the non-secure world. The key aspect is that the uh, cryptographic keys and certificates, they never leave the uh, secure domain and their visibility is again limited to a very small uh, part of the software in the bigger scheme of things. So any vulnerability in the rest of the system will still make sure that your keys, which are probably one of the most important assets, assets on a device, are not compromised. That is it uh, I wanted to cover today. We have another talk um, uh, by one of my colleagues on Wednesday, um, Wednesday afternoon, and, and where he's going to talk about the compartmentalization in TFM in uh, great more detail. Um, many of us are here. 
Uh, many of our team members are here uh, in this conference. If you would like to talk about um, PSA or TFM or anything in general, please find us. Uh, we'll be, we have an ARM booth as well, so most of us will be hanging around in, in that booth. Questions? Yeah, um, does someone have a mic? Yeah. I'm not sure if it is on. Yeah, that works. Is this compatible with Fido? Because it's very similar to the whole Fido stack. Trying to understand the difference between this and Fido without biometrics or something. Yeah, so. I am aware of the FIDO stack, but I don't fully, add, uh, I have not gone to the technical details of the FIDO software stack. Um, so I can't really comment on well, you've that. Well, you've got attestation, mm -hmm. keys, yeah. security of the device, they describe the whole stack using PLS, keys mm -hmm. to maintain the state of the session. <coughs> yeah. Um, but it's certainly worth the look at the specs open. Um, I don't think you have to be a member to read the specs. The uh, PSA program is uh, slightly wider than the just securing the device, uh, the just, just securing the some parts of bits. Uh, at some point, it will cover things like certification or it could, it could become much more wider than uh, just the firmware framework. So in that context, um, FIDO can be a PSA compliant entity um, at some point. So what we have is uh, specification and a open source implementation. That doesn't mean that this is the only implementation that can exist, as long as it complies to the specifications that we provide. Me as a TFM engineer, as a TFM tech lead, I would like everyone to use the TFM, but from the program point of view, as long as it's any, any software solution up, um, complies to the specifications, it, is, it would still be PSA compliant. Any last question? In which case, thank you everyone. <laughs>